where to begin? Well, this programme sort of changed my life, um, so it's quite difficult to put it in sort of into five minutes. It started like this. I was on College Green on the day after, uh, on the, day after the referendum. The vote had just come in, and I got a, I got a call from the... a missed call from the editor of Panorama, who's never, as far as I can remember, ever given me any work before, so I thought, what's, <laughs> what's happened here? And... Um, I spoke to him after and he said, well, would you go and do a panorama? We just want to talk to ordinary people, sort of dread phrase. He said, this is, if ever there was a time to really talk to the people to find out what they were thinking, it is now. Fair enough. And I want you to go and just listen. So that's kind of, that's kind of what I did. I persuaded him to send me to Birmingham and the black country, which is an area sort of I know well. So it was field work, really. I just went round talking to people, asking them what they thought. I was told by the production team, you must just listen. And I, I got that. I wasn't there to go and harangue people, tell them what they got wrong. It's quite a difficult conversational skill, actually, on a journalistic skill, because they said, just go and listen. Well, what you can't do is say, go on, talk. You know, that, that doesn't work. Neither does asking completely open questions. Neither does haranguing them. So you've got to find a kind of a, a middle route, just sort of chivvy people along, challenge their views, but just listen. And it was, anyone who's, who's had therapy knows it's basically about somebody just listening to you in a, in a non-judgmental fashion. And it's, and it's not something the media does enough. Radio 5 Live, where I work, does it very well, particularly Nikki Campbell's programme in the mornings between 9 and 10 is, is a, a masterclass in how to do that. It struck me right at the beginning, the premise of it was fascinating. The editor said... Basically, we, we want to talk to people who are on... The, those who voted for Brexit are on the wrong side of globalisation. Yeah, he was right. But interestingly, as the very premise of the programme, that in itself would have absolutely baffled any of the people I was talking to. I can't walk down West Bromwich High Street and say, by the way, how does it feel to be on the wrong side of globalisation? They just wouldn't have, a, wouldn't have a clue what I was talking about. So this sort of gave me a hint to the kind of alienation we were, we were dealing with. And look, I, I reached sort of many conclusions, many of which were completely conflicting. The main one is this, is that we just don't talk to each other enough. It's a bit like football. I worked a lot with footballers and managers, and I worked a lot with football fans. Football fans haven't got a clue what managers and footballers go through, the stresses and strains. Equally, Managers and footballers and coaches haven't got a clue the pain we football fans go through. You know, it's, it's, a similar, it's a similar kind of disconnect. We're in it together, but really don't understand each other. Look, we're hung up in this country, quite rightly, on issues revolving around gender, uh, sexual orientation, race and disability. I absolutely get that. I made a programme once called Why I've Got No Black Friends. And it was, I went, to, I'd look around at my wedding... Um, when I got married to Jane Garvey, who presents Woman's Hour, I remember saying to her, what do you notice about the 140 people here? They're all white. It's unbelievable. You know, we had, we had there was gay people there. My family's Croatian, so there were lots of Croats there. But hang on, we're all white. What's going on? So, sort of explore that. But actually, more profound than that is, it's not colour or, or sexual orientation. It's class. We just don't talk to each other. We just don't have that conversation. Now, outside of London, everyone lives in separate areas, broadly speaking. There's some mix. What's more profound, in London, we absolutely live on top of each other, cheek by jowl, and still don't have any connection. Now, I don't mean just a polite conversation walking down the road. Obviously, if you're a decent person, you do that. I mean, be friends with, choose to spend time with. The, the road I lived in, or we lived in as a family in, in Hammersmith, it was a, a pretty typical you know, West London road. There'd be two million pound house, house converted into four flats, all identical looking, but serving different function. Next one, three million pound house with Olympic swimming pool in the basement, you know, the kind of thing. Next one, DOS house. Uh, next one, sort of Serbian run crack den. That was actually our sort of neighbor. And then so it went on down, down the road. Everyone's cheek by jowl, never have anything to do with each other. You know, I, 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 actually, I did with the Serbian sort of crack den because I, I spoke the same language. So, you know, I had some interesting conversations with them. I said to my, I said to my daughter, you know, I was rolling her eyes. She's 13, my younger daughter, 13 years old. Um, she went to a state 
State um, uh, Primary School in, in West London, and then, to my shame and discredit, end up at a private girls' school. Not my decision, but, you know, there you go. And I said to her, the real danger here, sociable as you are, the danger here, you could go through the rest of your life without having a working-class friend, right? The rest of your life, you could live till you're 100. You might not actually have a conversation with a working-class person. Now, I don't mean, like, you might be nice to a plumber or something, obviously. I mean, just lean in and spend time with and choose to be with. Now, interestingly, I do, and I do partly because I sort of got profile, so I talk to a lot of people, but mainly through football. A football is the most incredible way of, the, of, the, of different bits of society mixing. It's the, you tell me anywhere else where a high court judge and a, and a dustman can sit next to each other and be on a level, you know, before, during, and after a game. And that's my... And, and the people mix it. And they don't just talk about football. You, you tend to be with the same people week in, week out. You become friends. And I can't think of where else in society... That, I can't think where else in society that, that happens. I mean, I suppose there's the NHS. If there's a Westminster bubble, I don't know why there's a Westminster bubble, because every MP, as I understand it, has got to have surgeries and has got to talk to people of all classes. So they should really know what everybody's thinking, and if they don't, then it's really bewildering. But generally, we need to get out there, walk about, just get out your comfort zone, and just find a way of talking to people and create the kind of forums where we can do that. Jury service is another one. You know, I just, perhaps we need something else, and there should be carrot and stick here. You know, you, you absolutely have to go to a public meeting with 200 others every, every year, or something dreadful is going to happen to you. I don't know. Just, just force people to have conversations with each other. Just one more thing. The, after about a couple of months after making this documentary, I was engaged to go and speak at the, the or chair a conference at British House in Rio, where they were, you know, banging the tub for sort of British trade and so on, doing great work there, I must say. And one of the speakers was uh, a woman called Gillian Tett from the runs the Financial Times in the in the United States, and she made a very passionate speech about how brilliant we are in this country at financial services. And she told the story of, a, of an organization which promotes financial services, which used to be called British Invisibles. The irony being, of course, that nobody took any notice of what British Invisibles were saying because it was invisible. So they went from a, a stupid name to the most boring name ever, which is now the International Financial Services London Group, which, which will lull anybody off to sleep. But she was... She was making the point, we're brilliant at this, we're fantastic at this kind of work. Yes, I get that, but you try telling that to people in Dudley or West Bromwich or Tipton or Tividale. It needs to be explained. Part of your duty, if you work in a hedge fund, if you work in a city, somehow you've got to get the information over how that is of benefit to you if you're in Dudley or Tipton or Tividale. Get out, I don't know how you do it. Build a playground, build a hospital. I don't know, Just perhaps get suitcases full of money and hand it out there like Pablo Escobar in Colombia or something, just, just to try and win some hearts and minds over. It, every, every company who works in that field has got to take it upon themselves to just get out there and just somehow, just even cynically, just show the wealth, share the wealth, or try and, try and con people into thinking that, they, that they're sharing the wealth. In terms of in terms, of the world, in terms of the world at work, in terms of how different people can communicate with each other, just an interview I did the other day, a guy had got in the paper somewhere, he'd taken over the management of Sofitel at, at uh, Gatwick Airport, and he'd undertaken to, drink, to have a coffee with every one of his 280 staff in his first month while he was there. And so I did an interview with him, and I just thought, well, it actually, it was very easy to take the mickey out of that, but actually, what a brilliant thing to do. I think it's too easy in management to think, oh, I'll end up speaking to everybody sooner or later. I think unless you timetable it and force yourself to do it, then, then I don't think it's ever going to happen. I once heard it denigrated at the BBC, that style of management, as a management by walking around. Right, well, I don't know whether you denigrate it, but you know, I'm all in favour of it. Just get out there and just try and speak to everybody. Just more people speaking to more people, and things will get better, I feel pretty sure. Yeah.